Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, I will be presenting the case of 81-year-old female who presented to ER with complaints of shortness of breath and cough since 3 days. Oh. On primary assessment, patient was conscious, oriented and obeying commands. On airway, patient uh, airway was patent, no secretion, no pooling of saliva, no gurgling of saliva. On breathing, patient was maintaining a saturation of 93% at room air with a respiratory rate of 22 per minute. Air entry was bilaterally reduced with bilateral basal crubs and bronchi were present. Okay. At this point of time, patient was connected to the nasal prongs and at 3 liters of oxygen, patient was maintaining a saturation of 96 to 97%. Coming to circulation, patient had a BP of 130 per 90 mm Hg with a pulse rate of 98 per minute. On disability, patient had a GCS of 15 out of 15, pupils were equal and reactive to light. On exposure, patient was febrile and had a GRBS of 140 mg per deciliter. Okay. Adjunct to the primary survey, we had done an ABG. The pH was 7.35 with a PCO2 of 43, bicarbonate of uh, 22 and a lactate of 2.8. Uh, to PO2? PO2 was uh, 90. Mm. And uh, to rule out whether there is any infective etiology, CBC CRP was done mm. and uh, total count was 8280 with a CRP of 21. Okay, what was the uh, neutrophil among this 8000? <coughs> neutrophil was 85% neutrophil. 85% neutrophil. neutrophil. Okay. okay. So, uh, okay. Coming to the sample history. Sample history. Continue. We'll continue. Uh, 81 year old lady, mm. known case of bronchial asthma, type 2 diabetes mellitus, <laughs> systemic hypertension and CAD post COVID in 2021 presented to the ER with complaints of shortness of breath since 3 days which was of grade 3 MMRC. It was associated with V's and it was increased on exertion. No history of orthopnea or PND. Patient also had cough since 3 days which was productive with whitish mucoid expectoration. The expectoration was not foul smelling or blood tinged. Patient also had fever of duration one day, mm. which was low grade, it, uh, intermittent. It was not associated with chills or rigor. Uh, coming to the systemic examination on uh, respiratory system, patient uh, air no, entry. You already said there is bilateral wrong guy. So uh, we have an 81 year old female. Uh, basically, we will put it like she is a known bronchial asthma. Uh, bronchial asthma, she had uh, COVID. Uh, and she had some post-COVID changes in the lung. Now came to the ER with the history of uh, fever, cough and breathlessness. So that is the history. That's the only thing that she has. 81 year old. Uh, how frequently she was getting admitted to the hospital? Uh, every two to three months, one episode she was getting of breathing difficulty. Every two to three months she is getting admitted to the hospital. Okay. So, uh, another one more question, whether she was vaccinated for H. influenza right. and pneumococcal? Pneumococcal influenza vaccination was done in uh, 2023 November. Okay. So, uh, that has been done. So, uh, basically there is a lady who is coming to hospital uh, every two to three months with an acute exacerbation of breathlessness. So, uh, the possibilities that we need to consider here, one, uh, it will be a simple exacerbation, what is happening right now. Uh, which is a new onset because three days only is there and uh, previously when was she last admitted? Last she was uh, admitted uh, two months ago. Two months ago. So two months later before she was admitted she was taken vaccination maybe during that time. Now she has come back with another infection. Okay. So uh, one thing two months period she was okay, okay. and between she has come with uh, uh, an infection. One thing will be a new onset infection. Second thing is what? What, what are the other possibilities? Acute exacerbation bronchial asthma. It is simple acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma itself, maybe due to the climatic changes and the exacerbating factors and be viral infection, bacterial infection of any of these things. Since you said there is V's as well as crepitations. V's, okay, crepitations, we need to think why she is having crepitations. There are two reasons or three reasons why she is having crepitation. One, it is a post COVID lung and again, age, 81 year old. And the third thing is that recurrent infections that she is having since last uh, uh, maybe two to three years she is having recurrent infection. So with this background we need to see whether are we missing some diagnosis because all the chronic airway diseases we can rather than calling them as a chronic obstructive airway diseases we can call it as chronic airway disease. 
for this lady. So chronic airway disease, we COPD will be there, bronchial asthma will be there, and on top of that, bronchitis. So all these things together, we can call it as a chronic airway disease, and it can be an overlapping conditions that the patient will be frequently coming to the ER with multiple issues. So here, uh, the exacerbating factor, whether we have to see, it is just a simple exacerbation or else there is an additional lung parenchyma involvement like in terms of a pneumonia that is a new thing whether she has developed any pneumonia or on top of that what is her lung condition because of the post covid there can be some fibrosis on top of that she can develop recurrent infections or else bronchial asthma recurrent infection all this thing together she can move on to a condition as bronchitis so this is our uh, present situation so what are the good things in her right now she is not hypoxic there is no PCO2 build up. So that is one good thing. There is no type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure. But she is getting recurrent infection as evident by right now also there is some mild CRP increase with a shift to left as shown by the increase in the neutrophil count. So in our emergency room, it's pretty simple to manage. It is not very complicated for this patient because we need to give her nebulizations because there is wheeze associated and uh, the next thing we need to start her on an antibiotic so that is a main important thing because already uh, a destructor lung what needed to be done we need to see the next important thing will be an x-ray finding what is was the x-ray finding in x-ray there was only increased bronchiovascular markings uh, only increased bronchiovascular markings okay so uh, what all things you need to evaluate imagine that this patient you are suspecting a recurrent infection whether any time a ct test has been done for her in the last uh, maybe one or two years that is the question any time a no, ct a ct test has, has not been done so maybe this time we should be thinking of doing is hrct test which is the most important gold standard for a diagnosis of bronchitis so only my concern our concern will be why she is coming frequently to the hospital rather than just labeling it as an just acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma, whether a bronchial asthma and bronchitis can coexist. Both can coexist. There is nothing like only you should have bronchitis, only you should have bronchial asthma. This can coexist. You can have COPD overlapping with this, COPD overlapping with the bronchitis. All those things can happen. Basic pathophysiology is behind uh, bronchitis is what? There is recurrent airway infections. So recurrent airway infection as a result, there is poor mucociliary clearance. As a result, the, uh, the whatever be the airway clearance that need to happen is not happening. So that's it. So uh, whether we need to get a positive history, we need to ask the two to three months period whether she is producing a lot of sputum. So that is one important history that we need to ask for. So whether there is anything like that, she was telling. In only during the exacerbation, she is telling of uh, large quantity mucoid sputum, sputum. is coming. Otherwise, she is not having. She's okay. Having. So, if that is there, then definitely we can put label it as probably we are dealing with an additional longer cases also. So, uh, right now, what we have got, we have got an elderly lady who has come with breathlessness. Probably, maybe a viral infection that is because she is vaccinated against uh, pneumococcal and usually two months time it will be prevented. But there are other bacterial infections also. Uh, and this group of patients, they are more prone to develop what type of bacterial infections? Gram negative bacteria. They are more prone to develop hospital acute like pseudomonas sort of an infection so pseudomonas is very common in this group of patients so if they are clearly saying there is copious sputum greenish sputum and all those things definitely you need to think in terms of whether be dealing with a pseudomonas or maybe due to the high snowfills in this uh, uh, sputum also that color can be changed so these are our questions in our mind so what ideally needed to be done for this patient is ideally we need to go ahead and do an hrct test and we need to see whether there is any underlying bronchitis is there or not if there is an underlying bronchitis, anything major that is going to change in your management, that is my next question. I am telling you to take a CT, but are we going to see any major changes in her management? But there is no major changes that we are going to attribute. Only thing, maybe if we have lot of copious amount of sputum that is coming, the only treatment option is airway clearance. You need to teach them maneuvers, rehabilitation exercises, how to exer how to uh, bring out the sputum. Maybe you need to give some n style or 3% saline nebulization so that the sputum can be cleared easily. So that is the only option that is available for your bronchitis. What are the problems that uh, we can anticipate in her? Suppose this lady is coming with the same history and is giving a history of hemoptysis. So, when she is giving a history of hemoptysis, so what are your consideration in your mind? The same lady, same history, she has come with hemoptysis. Any 
tumor ma cyst er so three possibilities that you need to consider simple things one is bronchitis other one bronchitis on top of that there can be most commonly tuberculosis in india so tuberculosis there is an additional tuberculosis that is why she is having frequent frequent exacerbation maybe the tuberculosis is not been treated so two things and maybe as you said maybe an underlying tumor also we need to consider and very uh, if the hemoptysis to the large extent maybe they require a bronchial artery embolization so in that situation definitely an early ct is warranted and we need to look in for all the named what is rasmussen aneurysm that is actually seen in your tuberculosis the cavity artery lesions and whether there is in any aneurysm that blood vessel is getting ruptured then you have to think of uh, your bronchial artery embolization and all those things but when she is having hemoptysis definitely ct is indicated but if there is no hemoptysis uh, maybe you put her to diagnose as bronchitis it is the gold standard investigation x ray and all we will say this honey combing appearance and all those things but it sometimes it is very difficult to appreciate but is significant bronchitis yes we will be able to appreciate in the x ray also but uh, ct hrct chest is the gold standard that you need to consider and what are the other challenges in them so other challenges is frequent infections like what she is having every third week or fourth week she is coming back to the hospital with recurrent recurrent infection so in order to prevent that what can be done vaccinations can be given. vaccination can be done then this is an area where we can give an antibiotic for a longer time maybe the one recommended regimen is to give macrolides mm -hmm. the macrolides uh, can be given maybe like azithromycin 250 mg alternate days as a prophylactic dose it is not to treat any infection to prevent the patient from developing any major chest infection so these group of patient so uh, like they are having bronchitis ild very frequent hospital admission we can try with this regimen of giving azithromycin tablet 250 mg every alternate day but they can have other infections also but usually when you give azithromycin you are mostly gram positive and some of the atypicals will be covered so viral it will not be covered obviously and as you said vaccination is the key thing and very rarely uh, if the patient is having significant copious amount of sputum and hemoptysis uh, lobectomy is also needed to be done for if the patient is having bronchitis so uh, as if now for this lady if we want to differentiate we need to have a clear diagnosis yes we need to go ahead and do maybe a pulmonary function test also might be helpful but as you said the patient is already having bronchial asthma we just know how much is the severity of the disease that's it so even if you do a ct we are diagnosing with uh, bronchitis we are just going to label her as bronchitis but treatment option as such is not going to vary much but frequent hospital administration has uh, admissions definitely they need the prophylactic antibiotics so uh, what was done for her uh, she was started on iv antibiotics initially what antibiotics she was uh, started she was started on cefepirocin sulbactam initially okay. and uh, azithromycin also was added then iv steroids and nebulization was given uh, but uh, this was persistent so they hiked the antibiotic into piptas and then uh, the wheeze and uh, the breathing difficulty came down okay she was maintaining a saturation of 95% at room air on discharge any time uh, any sputum culture was sent for uh, yes sputum culture was sent it uh, came as pseudomonas positive pseudomonas positive, positive. so pseudomonas so you are thinking in terms of pseudomonas then definitely you need to go ahead and uh, start it from the piperacil desobactam uh, when you think of pseudomonas you remember you have to go for an anti pseudomonal penicillin which are the anti pseudomonal agents that you can give 1 2 3 4 5 cefepirocin cefepirocin okay cefepirocin sulbactam is not a classical anti pseudomonal when you say anti pseudomonal the first thing that should come in your mind is piperacil desobactam piperacil desobactam piperacil desobactam ticraselin all those things then next thing will be quinolones respiratory quinolones levofloxacin moxifloxacin these are all anti this has got anti pseudomonal coverage the next agent aminoglycosides aminoglycosides they have also got good gram negative coverage and as you said fourth generation cephalosporins like cefepime to subact up cefepime even plain cefepime itself is an anti pseudomonal or carbipenems any of the carbipenem group it has got anti pseudomonal effect so that pseudomonas that is grown in her it is significant history so i would like to get a ct to just see whether there is any bronchitis if this lady is having a bronchitis then definitely she requires an 
mostly vaccination anyway vaccination will be continue and also maybe a prophylactic antibiotic so that she don't come back to the hospital very frequently and if she is producing a lot of sputum then only we will require to teach her regarding the airway clearance maneuvers and all those things and otherwise uh, that should be okay maybe uh, is it justifiable initially to start sepirosin sulbactam for this patient was it justifiable that's my question Uh, two months back, she has left the hospital, no? In a year, multiple times. We can expect a cavity relation. With See, when you would have wanting her to put her on straight away piperacillin and dosovactam? Two weeks in search for Ah, very short term, the patient is coming back. We are very clear it is here thinking in of some terms of an hospital acute infection. Definitely, you would have straight away started on uh, anti-sodomonal penicillins then. Then any previous like sputum culture? We have any previous sputum culture. If the lady is coming back again, I will not do a mistake of putting her starting on a sepiracil sulbactam. Maybe already there is a sputum culture which has grown piperacil sulbactam. We will start. I don't say there is any wrong in starting sepiracil sulbactam. There is any, but whenever it is required, you need to escalate it accordingly. Maybe the disease itself would have subsided uh, by the time. Was sepiracil sulbactam sensitive for this? Uh, it was sensitive. It was sensitive. Yes, it was sensitive. So, it was not an issue. So, uh, maybe the disease would have taken some more time to subside. That was the reason. The moment you have to wait. So, how? when will you change an antibiotic? That is the next question. So, when will you decide? Okay, you started a patient on a lower spectrum antibiotics. You started, for example, you have started the same lady on ceftriaxone. So, how long you will wait? And what are the, what are the things that you will say, I need to hike up the antibiotics? Continuous fever spikes, 48 hours the fever spikes won't change. Again, it will take 48 to 72 hours. You have to look clinically the patient. Any parameter, oxygen requirement is increasing. Hemodynamic compromise. So these are the things you have to suspect whatever antibiotic that you are giving may not be sufficient enough. You need to escalate it to the antibiotic. So uh, that is the reason when we think Persistent fever. I will say rather than one episode of fever, two episode of fever, they will have fever. But the, you see the fever, the patient has having one or two degree Fahrenheit fever. Now it is just 900 degree Fahrenheit. So the fever is subsiding. But clinically she looks okay. She There is no tachypnea. But after some time the patient is developing tachypnea, hypotension. Definitely you need not wait. You can go ahead and escalate the antibiotic. Usually 48 hours is what we have to get for a reasonable response. But lab parameters will again take more time. So suppose today was 30, then suddenly the CRP has increased to 215 next day. Don't jump and change straight away, hike up the antibiotics. Just see how the patient is responding. If the patient is comfortable, you are feeling it clinically okay, then you can just wait for another 24 hours and depending upon that, you can decrease upon the antibiotic. And another most common thing what we said regarding tuberculosis, definitely she need to be screened for tuberculosis. Pseudomonas and tuberculosis can be there together. But Another thing is fungal infections. So this group of patients, very frequent hospital admission, not responding to antibiotic, your parochial is negative, then you have to consider whether are we dealing with some fungal infections also, especially aspergillus, what will be the fungus, we need to look in that aspects also. If the patient is not improving with your antibiotic therapy, uh, clinically they will not improve. You will have a decrease in the CRP and all, but clinically the patient is still tachypneic, V is everything is persistent, then you have to think, are we dealing with some fungal infections? So these things also should be kept in your mind. So. Uh, fungal infection in any lung disease, if not responding to a regular treatment, it is not just bronchitis, COPD, bronchial asthma or any of these things, you need to ask for history of exposure, specifically history of exposure. Now, uh, uh, you heard a famous celebrity husband died due to his chest infection. He was handling birds, so occupational exposure. So all those things should be, you should be asking uh, very frequently and uh, you should, according to that, you need to hike up the antibiotics, maybe an antifungus like oriconosol may be required for this group of patients. So that is the basic recommendation. So bronchitis, if you diagnose, it's a simple treatment. The problem is that frequent admission. So we need to target that frequent admissions and how to reduce the hospital admission is our criteria. So maybe they can have this positional draining things and uh, taking this antibiotics and usually if they have got nebulizers at home or not, maybe they can escape from getting admitted to the hospital. And post-COVID, 
post covid the significant increase in this all the chest infection because the maybe they will be having a normal lung maybe a just simple bronchial asthma on top of that covid and fibrosis all those things complication taking into a bronchiectasis so they can come so that's what we have seen after covid no lot of respiratory infections have increased so that one of the reason maybe we never had any symptoms because of covid but maybe some destruction would have happened due to the lung parenchyma could have destructed because of covid and very frequently we are getting infections anything else you want to add on regarding bronchitis or any of anything regarding this patient okay we, uh, have you taken an ecg for her uh, ecg was taken it was, it was normal okay fine okay thank you